Hello and welcome to Twist List, today we are looking at, 10 Forgotten Battles That Shaped History. The Battle of Hastings on October 14, 1066, is widely regarded as a defining moment in English and European history. The victory of William the Conqueror against the Saxon King Harold Godwinson was a direct result of the latter's march to defeat the Vikings at Stamford Bridge just weeks prior. Thus, the last Saxon king had no choice but to lead his tired, depleted host back south to face the Duke of Normandy at the crossroads of history, his fate, and all of England's, sealed by the results of a battle long forgotten. It's worth noting, however, that the largely forgotten Battle of Fulford, which occurred just days before Stamford Bridge, was where it all began. When the Vikings landed on England's shores, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria decided to meet them in battle instead of awaiting a siege, the results were catastrophic. The armies of Mercia and Northumbria were almost completely destroyed and King Harold had no choice but to force march his army north, eventually defeating the Viking forces. Still, the victory was a hollow one. The losses suffered by the North meant they could not further reinforce Godwinson's army. Here are 10 other lesser known or forgotten battles that have shaped the world as we know it. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by, June 27, 1709. The year 2013 marked the 500th anniversary of the Battle of Flodden Field, which over the years has gained renown and near legendary status in Scotland. In other parts of the empire, however, it's one of the least well-known, which prompted the British government to spend £1 million, $1.65 million, on events to commemorate the occasion. That dream was cut short in the fields of Flodden when war inevitably broke out between England and Scotland. Despite outnumbering the English army, the Scots attempted to advance toward the English ranks with 5.5 metre, 18 feet, pikes. These weapons were cumbersome, meant for defense, the English weapon, the bill, was shorter and easier to wield. Likewise, arrows and gunfire rained down from the English lines, blunting the Scottish charge. By the early 1500s, it seemed Scotland was poised to achieve a lasting independence. King James IV of Scotland was a popular, beloved monarch, under his rule. The Scots expected a bright new era of perpetual peace with England. Estimates of the casualties suffered by the Scots vary from a conservative 5,000 to as high as 20,000. James IV, the beloved Scottish monarch, was also killed in battle, becoming the last British king to have had such a fate. Likewise, dozens of earls, chieftains, knights, religious leaders, and members of parliament also fell. The severe losses in both men and able leaders crushed Scotland's dream so much so that women had to be banned from weeping in the streets of Edinburgh. The great rivalry neared its end, and within a century the crowns of Scotland and England were united. Number 4 on the list is, on the field of Angelot, the spring of Goliath, the Mamluks under Kuchus forced Kipka to charge their forces recklessly, feigning a retreat. The tactic, so often used by the Mongols to devastating effect, was their downfall. Reserve cavalry forces swung from the sides, hemming the Mongols in a trap. Kipka and most of his forces were slain where they stood. The Middle East has had a tumultuous and never-ending history of conflict, often due to religious differences. But the long-standing enmity between the Muslims and Christians in the region was ultimately put to the test against the Mongols, of all people. Then, almost as if by a miracle, Ulugu's brother, the great Khan Monk, suddenly died, prompting Hulagu to return to the steppes to facilitate the succession. An alliance between the Mongols and Christians never materialized. Nobles felt that Muslims were even more preferable neighbors compared to the barbarian tribes, they even gave the Mamluks safe passage and the right to purchase supplies. The Pope himself declared that anyone who supported the Mongols would be immediately excommunicated. The Mamluks quickly consolidated their position in the Holy Land. Kuchas would later be assassinated by his comrade, Bibus, who declared himself the new sultan. Meanwhile, far in the east, Hulagu vowed revenge against the Mamluks to no avail as his attention was diverted elsewhere. His Mongol kin had converted to Islam and condemned his wanton cruelty against the Muslims. The Mongol campaign was led by Hulagu Khan, who had already forced the submission of various dynasties and kingdoms and caused the destruction of Baghdad. Over 300,000 Mongol warriors and their mercenary retinues were poised to strike into Egypt. Hulagu had even sent envoys to Christian nobles in the Levant, who were seriously entertaining the notion of a Franco-Mongol alliance. Thus, the Mamluk Sultan Qutuz knew the Mongols would be at a disadvantage. Hulagu Khan left his lieutenant Kipka, or Kitbuga, 
in command of over 20,000 Mongols and an unknown number of mercenaries. Qutuz, meanwhile, marched At through the Crusader territory to meet the Arabs, numbering between 80,000 and 120,000, suddenly found themselves at the end of a brutal beating. Their navies were smoked by Greek fire from Byzantine ships. Meanwhile, the Bulgarians were able to attack their armies from the rear. Christian slaves recruited by the Arabs defected en masse. These actions led to the collapse of the Umayyad Front, which lifted the siege of Constantinople. History has often told us of the sack of Constantinople in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade, and the fall of Constantinople in 1453 where an unlocked door doomed the city. We often forget the battle at its gates hundreds of years before these events that very likely saved Christianity. With chaos erupting in Byzantium, the Umayyad Caliphate saw it as a chance to invade. They made headway into Asia Minor and eventually found themselves at the gates of Constantinople. Turville's actions earned him the title savior of Europe but more than likely, this unlikely alliance between the two nations saved Christianity as a whole. If Constantinople had fallen in this particular forgotten battle, Islam would have spread further into Europe. The spread of Christianity into the Balkans and Russia would have been extinguished almost immediately. In AD 704, the deposed Byzantine Emperor Justinian II asked for the assistance of Turvel, the Khan of the predominantly pagan Bulgarians. Turvel acceded to the request and helped Justinian regain his throne. Sadly, Justinian broke the peace, stabbing Turville in the back by attacking his lands. This led to turmoil in the region and Justinian's death in battle. Hemmed in from multiple sides, the new Byzantine Emperor Leo III at the second Leo the Isaurian September 9, 1813. In recent article, we mentioned Leo how the sacred band, band of Thebes, the past and elite units made focus on a combined defense against the Arab hordes of the Amayyad the Battle of Electra, 371 A. BC. With Spartan dominance in the region finally broken, Theban supremacy began, putting the city-state above all others in Greece. Thus, the Greek alliance led by Thebes and Athens faced off against Philip of Macedon and his young son Alexander. The young would-be conqueror was only 18 years of age, but he had already earned enough of his father's confidence to be placed in command of the left wing of the Macedonian forces. Historical recounting of the battle is mostly vague, though from what we know, Alexander himself was one of the first men to charge the sacred band. Meanwhile, in neighboring Macedonia, King Philip II had his eye set on Greek lands. Philip had once threatened to invade Sparta, saying that if he set foot in their lands he would level it to the ground. The Spartans' laconic reply is the stuff of legend, if. Perhaps knowing that the Spartans, even in their weakened state, would prove to be a considerable challenge, Philip instead turned his attention to the rest of Greece. The Macedonian and Greek forces fought a pitched battle the entire day and eventually one side had to give. It was the Greeks who blinked first. The Athenians and Theban soldiers broke rank, but the sacred band held on bravely and were slaughtered nearly to the last man. By day's end, as Philip surveyed the carnage, he congratulated Alexander then turned his eye on a row of 300 dead men lying where the Macedonian spears had cut them down. He was told that this was the sacred band, who stood their ground when all others had fled, protecting their lovers and avoiding shame. Upon hearing this, Philip broke down in tears. And finally, at number one, Liu Bang and his ministers knew of Xi'an Yu's deep love for his concubine Yuji. She was said to have accompanied the warlord wherever he went. If she was captured, the Han strategists knew Xi'an Yu would have no choice but to rescue her. They imprisoned her deep in a ravine in Gaixia, Kaisha. The belief of Chinese superiority and its sphere of influence dates back to Confucian ideals, which were central to daily life during the Han Dynasty, 206 BC to AD 220. After both parties departed, each knew that only one would live to rule the land. In one of history's great tales of romance, Xiang Yu led 100,000 of his brave men straight into a trap. Deep in the valley, he caught sight of his beloved Yuji, and at once the Han deployed an ambush from ten sides. 
Xiang Yu rushed to Yuji's side and was ready to die with her, but Yuji committed suicide so Xiang Yu could escape. After their alliance and brotherhood toppled the Qin dynasty, Liu Bang of Han and Xiang Yu of Qi were wary of each other's intentions. During the banquet at Hongmeng, or Hong Gate, both parties met to celebrate the end of the rebellion. One of Xiang Yu's men suddenly performed a sword dance, brandishing his weapon and fluidly moving around the room until he could find an opportune moment to cut down the unsuspecting Liu Bang. Upon realizing the intention of the lieutenant, one of Liu Bang's own men also danced, his sword play meant to defend the Han Lord. Maddened with grief, Xiang Yu departed with the survivors, down to 800 men, only to be trapped near a river by the Han forces. With his love gone and nowhere to go, Xiang Yu killed himself as well. This was the moment when crafty tricks and knowing one's weaknesses toppled sheer military might, and the very reason why the Chinese refer to themselves as people of the Han rather than the Chu. By 202 BC, the battles between the Han and Chu would reach a pivotal climax. Xiang Yu was a powerful and ferocious general, Liu Bang was a crafty leader. A plan was soon developed to ensnare the king of Chu, halting the Mongols at Ain Jalut. The fifth spot on the list is occupied by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. The Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is still around, located in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Now, it's a research facility in the fields of neuroscience, plant biology, quantitative biology, and, not surprisingly, genomics. It was originally opened in 1910 by Charles Davenport, and was known as the Carnegie Institute of Washington. The Eugenics Record Office kept detailed family records that allowed field workers to trace cases of mental and physical defects through a family line. Davenport also conducted studies on the importance of other inherited traits, such as hair and eye color, hair texture, and skin pigments. In addition to physical traits, they also tried to document how chronic diseases such as hemophilia and mental disorders like schizophrenia, along with what they called feeble-mindedness, were passed through a family. Number 4 on the list is, the immigrant problem. Those that supported eugenics looked to immigrants as a problem variable that was introducing all sorts of new and undesirable genetic qualities into the American gene pool. Researchers at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory isolated some of the problems. For example, those with Italian blood were said to be prone to violence. As part of their research, prison and mental institution populations across the country were surveyed to find out just how many members of these populations came from what immigrant group. After outbreaks of illnesses like smallpox and cholera in New York City and immigrant hub Ellis Island, the work of the eugenics movement began to gain credence. By 1911, they were operating hand in hand with the Immigration Restriction League to influence Congress and the Surgeon General to implement restrictions on immigration.
At the third place we have, Better Babies and Fitter Families Contests. As the eugenics movement took off, state fairs across the country started holding Better Babies Contests. In some respects, it made sense. Mothers were encouraged to bring their babies to fair judging contests, and in much the same way as livestock was judged, babies would be judged on things like health, weight, and size. While it also helped promote health and good child care, the this isn't so bad part of this entry ends right about there. Better Babies soon evolved into Fitter Families, a contest where whole families would present judges not only with their happy, healthy babies, but with an abbreviated version of their racial pedigree. Doctors would perform examinations on all the members of the family, awarding and deducting points according to guidelines, and families were given a letter grade to show just how eugenics friendly their family was. Winners would be rewarded with medals and trophies in these contests, which remained hugely popular throughout the 1920s. At the second spot is, pioneered by a Stanford professor. The whole thing was started by a Stanford professor named David Starr Jordan. A longtime student of Charles Darwin and the ideas of natural selection and Mendelian genetics, Jordan grew up in western New York and pursued an education in botany and science. After teaching at a number of different universities, it was when he went to Stanford that he truly began preaching his values, including education, conservation, and eugenic breeding. After writing several books on the topic of eugenics, he was one of the founding members of the Eugenics Committee of the American Breeders Association and the Eugenics Record Office. Chief among his beliefs was that the upper class of America was being constantly eroded by the lower class, and that careful, selective breeding would be necessary to preserve the country's upper crust. And finally, at number one, inspired Hitler's master race. We've mentioned it once already in brief, but it's worth revisiting again in greater depth. The American eugenics movement formed the basis for the Third Reich's belief in a master race and their attempts to create one. There was a bizarre sort of mutual respect that went on between American eugenics supporters and the Nazi party. In 1937, the American Eugenics Society issued statements of praise for the work that the Nazis were doing to cleanse the gene pool. For them, the scale on which the Nazis were carrying out their mass sterilization was what they had wanted for America. Original writings of eugenics supporters spoke of cleansing the American population by methods ranging from gas chambers to simply leaving the lower classes to the mercy of the elements or to disease. They went on to lament that American society wasn't ready for such a widespread, sweeping cleanse and saluted the Nazis for doing exactly what they had wanted for their own country. Hitler's fondness for the theories and science behind American eugenics was clear, he would not only quote American texts, 
but use them as evidence to support his madness and to recruit others to his cause. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more then please hit the subscribe button.